We are in week two of our series, Out of the Grave. Who? Man, oh man, week one with Pastor Ben just last Friday. Can you believe that was last Friday? That feels like more Fridays ago than just one. Uh, but he, he took us into what it means to walk in Jesus. Normally people say, I walk with someone, but the Bible says to walk in Christ. And what does that mean? That we take on all of Christ's traditions, all of his ways as our own, right? And so today for week two, I wanted to continue us around the bigger question of this series, which is what does it look like now that Jesus is out of the grave? Like, what does that practically look like for me in my life? We celebrated Easter not that long ago, had an epic Easter weekend, but like, what now, right? A lot of us might be asking. And so today for week two of Out of the Grave, I'm gonna talk through our series verse and what it means to let our roots grow deep in Jesus to establish our faith. You guys ready? Yeah? Okay, now let's all stand for the reading of God's word in Colossians 2, series scripture, verse 6 to 7. It says this, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Let's pray one more time. God, we thank you that your word does not return void. Your word is living and active. And it's going to set out to do the very thing it is intended to do, which is to make us more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Now give a high five as you take your seat. And let's give it up for our worship team. Thank you. Vox Gen Worship. Love the love. Love it, love it. Awesome, awesome. Okay. So. What does it look like if we understand that Jesus rose from the grave and how does that actually play out in our everyday life? Who would like to know this, the answer to this question? Because I feel like a lot of times we as a believer, we understand that Jesus defeated the grave, defeated sin, defeated shame, and that we're now called to life in him, a victorious life. But how many of us often find that we go right back to the grave that we were set free from? A lot of us as believers, as you walk with Jesus, you might begin to feel a disparity within you because you're like, I know I'm a new creation, yet why are these old habits and these old ways still creeping up on me? Yeah, anyone with me? We're going to get a little real tonight. And so I thought, anyone here like movies? Yeah, I'm a movie girl, okay? So I thought to change things up, I'd show us a quick movie clip. So, media, if you would, let's turn our eyes. <gasps> Look at me! I know, we seem to be inside I'm each other. old! I beg your pardon. Oh, I'm like the Crypt Keeper! Okay, that's enough. My wedding's tomorrow. Oh my God, my wedding's tomorrow. Ah, I can't marry Ryan. Ew. Okay, 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 okay. Anyone ever seen Freaky Friday? If you haven't, you should. It's pretty good. But here we have a situation where the mom and daughter have switched bodies and they wake up and they realize that they are not in their own bodies but in each other's. But how many of us kind of feel like sometimes in faith it can be like that? Like we know that we know that we are now in Jesus, yet sometimes we feel like out of body, like we feel something not in sync with how things are supposed to be. So I just thought that that was a fun way to show that disparity, that tension that we feel. Because here's the thing. When you receive Jesus, you are fully saved. 
But then begins the process of what we call sanctification, which means every day, yes, you are wholly saved at the beginning when you, sit, uh, when you pray the Lord's Prayer, when you pray the sinner's prayer, I mean. But there's a process now that you go on to become more like Jesus, right? Because on the inside, you gave your life, but now on the outside, things have to align with what is on the inside, and if we're being honest, sometimes we're going to have an epic moment of worship here, an epic moment of prayer here within the walls of church. Yet the moment we step back foot outside or go back home on a Friday night or go back to school on a Monday morning, sometimes we're like, wait, what? I thought I just said Jesus is Lord, but out of the same mouth, I'm dropping some words I shouldn't be saying. Like I'm cussing. Like what is going on with me? Like I don't feel like this is the real me. Because Pastor Ben, last week, he said, the new you is the real you. You guys with me? Because if we're being honest, in that moment where there is a collision of the new self and the old self, we probably find ourselves asking the questions, wow, maybe I don't know God. Wow, maybe that encounter wasn't a real encounter. Maybe I'm just thinking it up in my head. Or, wow, maybe I'm not meant to be Christian or... Maybe I'm too sinful. Maybe I'm too sinful to do this holy living kind of stuff. And maybe I didn't actually mean it at church. Can I just tell you right now, Vox Jen, that if you are thinking those thoughts, you best know that that is not from Jesus. That's actually probably prompted by someone called the devil. Because it says in John 10, 10, that the devil came to steal kill and destroy so what is he going to do he's going to want to see so uh, so seeds of doubt in your mind to doubt the whole validity of jesus in your life but it still feels so real pastor jackie what do i do right it's confusing because sometimes we feel like if it's not real on the inside then duh it's not going to translate on the outside because, you know, there's even like some scripture that can kind of back this up, like Proverbs 23, 7, for as a person thinks within himself, so he is. We are our thoughts, essentially. Or we can recall Jesus rebuking the Pharisees. They were known to just act like they had it all, but inside they had nothing real and, and, and genuine. They would just look the holy part, but then another moment later, you find their true motives were not really rooted in Jesus. And so we're thinking, oh man, maybe I'm one of them. Maybe I'm actually kind of fake. Maybe then you, the imposter syndrome starts to set in, and we think, I don't know about this whole Christianity thing, and then we end up blowing it all off. We let the seed of doubt grow into something much bigger than it should have. But I want to tell you something, Vox Jen, because here's the thing. If you have a moment here where you're like, wow, God is real. God loves me. God has chosen me. If you have that revelation, that for one means that the Holy Spirit has allowed you to draw near to Jesus to experience his goodness and his love. That was real, okay? That was not fake. The moments you have in these settings at, on a Friday, on a Sunday, when you go to conference, when you go to camp, those are all real, those are real, but it's now, what do you do with it? So maybe it's not that God isn't real. Maybe it's that we're not actually doing our part in the bigger picture. All right, Mark 4. We're going to go to Mark 4 because Jesus talks about this. Talks about it straight up, okay? It says in Mark 4. And Jesus was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And the other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
Now, if you jump into verses 14 to 20, Jesus actually breaks down this parable. A lot of times Jesus would teach in parables, which means he would take something very relatable to that setting of society to make a point about a spiritual principle, about a kingdom principle, right? Now, what's going on here is that there is a seed that has been sowed, that has been planted. There are four types of soils that it falls on. Number one is just on the path. It's just on the path. Like it was like if I scattered seed right here on the stage and then the Bible says that and then birds just came and devoured it right away. In, in verses 14 to 20 and uh, media, you can just put that up just so we can reference it. But it says those are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones, the rocky soil is the second one. The rocky soil is when they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy, but they have no root in themselves, endure for a while, and then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Now the second type of soil is rocky. Anyone go to the beach and then you, it's like some beaches, they're like fine, beautiful, soft sand, it feels like flour, but then you go on some beaches and then, and and it's like all stones and it hurts to walk on, you're like, ow, ow, I don't like walking. so this second seed is sown in rocky soil where the roots grew, but it had nowhere to fully get planted, and it was still shaky, right? Now, the third soil is seed sown, but then thorns grew, okay? Thorns, um, thorns of the world of deceitfulness, of riches, desires for other things. So those thorns are other things competing for our attention, like putting sports above Jesus, like putting drama, friend drama, relationship drama above Jesus, like putting your academics above Jesus. Those are the thorns that can very well be choking up the seed of the word of God that God is trying to sow into you. And then comes the fourth type of soil. This is the good soil. It says here in verses, uh, in verse 20, but those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30, 60, 100 times over. So then the question is, maybe it's actually not a God issue, but maybe after all the the doubts that come up, it's more of a heart soil issue. What is the soil of your heart like tonight, Vox Gen? What is it like? Have we allowed it to stay rocky so that roots can't actually get planted in it? Have we allowed it just to be on the surface level so it's hype, but we don't let it set in to become conviction in our life? Or maybe we've allowed the things around the world around us, our circumstances, choke up the good seed that God is trying to sow in because we're giving our circumstances, our problems, our issues, different idols in our life more attention than Jesus. Jesus himself. Can I tell you something? Let me tell you a story. Now, this was literally like um, two years ago. Okay, two years ago, I have a friend. She's actually the children's pastor of our church, Pastor Amanda. If you know her, you love her. And I know Mr. Vu over there loves her very much, right? But okay, one day, (laughs) one day, Pastor Amanda came to me and she gave me this. This is a, anyone like ginger ale, Bundaberg ginger ale? So this is a Bundaberg, yep, okay, see that hand up there? (laughs) But she gave me a leaf in a jar, and she was like, here, here you go. Any plant people in the house? Oh, okay, okay, some, some, all right. So anyway, she gave me this, and she was like, just keep it in water, and then once some roots grow, put it into soil, and you're going to have a whole plant. I said, Okay, I'll try because I am not a plant girl. I've tried to be, but right now, Pastor Ben can tell you I'm not doing too good. Okay, but I I said, okay, I'll do it anyways, right? So I literally, this is literally her. She she, uh, cut off a stem from her plant and just gave me a leaf, right? Now, I I set it on my counter and I was like, okay, well, nothing nothing to lose. I'm just going to let it sit on my shelf and see what happens, right? Lo and behold, it started to grow roots. That's crazy. (laughs) Okay, I don't know I'm going to put it back. This plant might die now. Okay. (laughs) Anyways, I didn't practice putting it back, but we're just going to leave this guy right here. (laughs) 
anyways, it started to actually grow roots. Now, I could just leave it in the water, but uh, the roots need soil. The soil is where the plant will get nutrients to continue to grow, to get footing. And let me tell you, that plant that she, that little stem that she gave me turned into this. It started to bear many leaves because I gave it a home, I gave it good soil, and I continued to water it. I'm telling you, the word of God is like a seed. It's like that little plant that started out as just this itty bitty little thing. I wasn't sure if it was going to make it or not. But if you cultivate it in the right environment by getting in to the house of God, by committing to a community, by opening up your Bible and reading your Bible, by praying, by learning how to talk to God, you will find that you're going to begin to grow, grow, grow like this plant right here. Now, some of you guys are going, yeah, yeah, that's all good. That's fine. That's, like, really obvious, right? But it's one thing to know it and one thing to actually do it. Because it says in the good soil part that you have to hear the word and accept it, which means you have to submit to it, which means you actually have to apply it, which means you can't just hear, oh, be kind to your neighbor, and then just be like, You're cool. You're good. You're awesome. Yeah. But it's like you actually have to be kind to your neighbor. So even when that neighbor starts to annoy you, you still have to act in the opposite spirit. Instead of going, I really want to ignore you right now, you go, you know what? I'm still going to draw near to you and show you the love of Christ. It's one thing to hear it, but another to accept it. Because it's only when you accept it and put it to work, you begin to bear fruit. So... Going back to the beginning, we have these moments. We have these moments in worship. We have these moments at church. And a lot of times, doubt's going to come our way. But my question today is, you actually have more power in your hands than you realize, Vox Jen. You have more power than you think. Because you can have a real moment. You go back to school on Monday, and you find out a friend betrayed you. And you're like, what? What? Right? I'm just going to go down the list here. You may have a real moment here, but then on Monday you get stressed because your grade is a, you're, you're about to flunk your class and you're like, how did this happen? How did I get here? You have a real moment with God, but then you go back home and your parents might still be fighting. But I'm telling you, here's, here's the thing you want to note down right now. It doesn't matter what happens around you because at the end of the day, you always have the power to control your response to the situation. So even when life feels like it's falling apart out there, you can still take the good word that was sown into your heart and say, you know what, God, I know that you still love me. You're still real. You are stronger than anything else. And I'm going to lean into your word more than the reality around me. That's how you let Your roots go deep. I'm telling you right now, once you have a real moment, you have to sustain it with the truth of God's word. Because if you leave here with just a nice moment, it's only going to stay a nice moment and it's only going to be as deep as your feelings go. Because sooner than later, you actually begin to forget how you actually felt that moment of love, it begins to fade away more and more with time, and then you have nothing to bank on. That, Vox Jen, is when you need to turn to the Word of God. The Word of God, because it's the Word that fuels that moment to continue to, to stoke the flame. It's like you can see it this way, that seed in your heart from the Word of God that was deposited on the inside of you, that's just the beginning. That's a little spark that went off in your spirit, awakened to the reality of Jesus. And what you need to do is now you need to fan the flame. You need to fan the flame. How do you do that? You add more wood. Anyone here start a campfire before or you have a fireplace at home? You better know, you probably know that the moment you stop feeding that fire wood and logs and things like that, it begins to die out. Let me tell you right now, you fan your spirit into flame. You feed the flame by reading the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is going to back up what you encountered on that one Friday, on that one Sunday. 
because it's going to remind you, hey, that was actually the love of God. It'll take you to verses like Ephesians 3, 14. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. You begin to open the Bible and read verses like that and remember, oh, I remember Christ made his home in me when I accepted him at the altar. And you don't look back going, oh, he was so good then. I wasn't dry then. I was so full of fire then. But you look back and you go, you know what? If it says that Christ made his home in me then, then he's still in his home now. I just need to remember and let my roots grow down deep to remember how high, how wide, how long, how deep is the love of God for me. The more you read the word, the more you know Christ and the love he has for you. We're living in an age where too many people don't know who they are just because of how they feel. Can I tell you right now, you know who you are by knowing whose you are. And you can only do that by reading the word of God. We're living in a day and age where we're itching just to hear the things that we want to hear, that comfort us, that make us feel good. Well, I'm sorry to say the word of God won't always make you feel good, but it will make you whole and healthy and holy and live a purpose-filled life. The word helps us to discern what is of God and what is not of God. How many times are we just sitting at our desk thinking, was that God or was that the devil or was that me? Was that God? Was that the devil or was that me? Like we get in our head, we get so mixed up. We're like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if that was God. I think that was me. Oh, it's probably me. I'm a sinner. Oh my goodness. What are we going to do? We go down this rabbit hole because we fail to discern what is of God and not of God when the answer is all in here, Vox Jen. He has given us everything we need to discern what is of God, what is the devil, and what is of your flesh. Can I break it down for you? Your flesh is always wanting comfort. Your flesh is always like, oh, I just want to take a break. Oh, please, please, I'm just too tired. Can I just sit down and, and just soak in the presence of God, just me and God? That's your flesh. That's your flesh. Your flesh always wants to comfort wants comfort, wants complacency, wants you to get casual. Now the devil, the devil will try to bring in discord. The devil will bring in condemnation, any bit of shame, any bit of lies telling you you're not good enough, you're not this enough, that you won't amount to anything in life. That is the lie of the devil. Anything that is feeding your flesh is also of the devil. Anything that brings you death, that reaps the, the, that reaps the fruit of death, that is the devil. Can I, can I take us to the Bible verse? It says in Colossians 3, 5 to 10, it says, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do those things when your life was still a part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds put on your new nature so right there all those words those words aren't meant to just make you feel bad about yourself like oh I'm a sinner but it's meant to tell you exactly what is of God and what is not of God God wants to make it so clear so you're running in the right lane and his lane that is covered by his blessing and protection. That is the will of God for your life, that you know what is God's ways, like Pastor Ben was saying. God's ways are full of blessing. It's full of life. Yes, it is hard, but it bears the fruit of the Spirit. Can I go to the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5. 22 to 26, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So anything pushing you to activate that love in your life, 
even when it's hard to love someone, that joy in your life, even when you wake up and you're like, this is a bad day. And like anyone have ever have that? You just wake up and you just know, oh gosh, it's going to be a hard day, but you still choose joy. That is of the Holy Spirit. Anything that is producing goodness and kindness. Let me tell you, it's really, really hard to be kind in a world that's so judgy these days. That just at any word, if they just find out you're Christian, they go, oh, snap, you are, you are a hater, right? Like it's so easy to be kind when it's easy, when everyone else is like smiling around you. But true kindness can actually be so challenging, right? To be faithful to be full of self-control. These are all great things, like words alone. You can tap them on your arm, feel good about yourself. You can hang them on your wall, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. They all sound good, but when you actually put them to work, it's actually kind of challenging. Are you guys with me? Yeah? But these are the things that God calls us to. So if anything is pushing you to have more endurance, to have more faith, that is of God. That is often not the comfortable route. But that is of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because our purpose is to look more like Jesus as we fulfill the great commission, which is to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? And so, Fox Jen, this is how you stay on fire for the Lord. This is how you stay out of the grave by knowing what the grave you came from was full of. It was full of yourself. It was full of selfishness. It was full of sin. It was full of everything that just brought you shallow pleasure. But God is calling you to live out of the grave in your new nature. He actually says to clothe yourselves differently. He says in Colossians 3.10, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. I'm going to end with this passage. In John 11, there's a story where Jesus realizes that a friend of his died. His friend's name is Lazarus. Okay. Now, there was a moment where there was a good chance Jesus could have saved this friend Lazarus from dying to begin with, but he actually waited. He waited, and it made no sense. Like, his sisters, Lazarus' sisters were upset. Jesus comes to the scene, the funeral scene. Everyone's crying. It even says, Jesus wept. Fun fact, that's the shortest Bible verse in the Bible. Jesus wept, two words, right? But anyways, he's in this very emotional scene, and Lazarus has now been dead for four days, four whole days. So it's like a fact that he is dead, dead. There's no chance that he's just sick and acting like he's dead. Like he is dead, dead. He's like in the tomb. The stone is there. All that stuff, right? And, um, and Jesus, he, he begins to move towards the cave with the stone. And Jesus tells everyone around him in um, John 11, verse 40, Jesus responds saying, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all the people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes his face wrapped in a headcloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. When Jesus brings you back to life, Jesus makes it so clear it's time to take your grave clothes off. It's time to take your old self off and run into the new. And yes, it is a gradual process of becoming more and more like Jesus. However, there should be no hesitation anyways to take off the grave clothes. And you do that by getting in to the word of God to know what new clothes you're now supposed to put on. Um, if I were to share, you know, growing up, I knew pretty quickly that I wasn't like the outdoorsy girl type, <laughs> okay? 
<laughs> it wasn't like one moment where I had like the epiphany of, oh, yeah, no, outdoors me don't go together. But it was probably me realizing over a pattern of many moments put together, right? But, um, you know, for example, I would go hiking. I would go to Mission Peak. God bless that trail. It was like really hard. Has anyone been on Mission Peak in Fremont? Yeah, okay. My goodness. Okay, so it's like, you know, I, I hiked that trail, and it was hot. There was no shade. I did not go early in the morning. No one told me. Someone just tricked me. Yep. So I'm here dripping sweat. I am huffing and puffing. And it's like, you know when your sweat dries up, and it gets, like, sticky, crusty, and it's like the salt, sweat salt crystallizes, and you're just, like, feel like such a mess? And I was like, ugh, right? Or another example is, like, I would go to the beach, I would go to Santa Cruz with my friends, a beach bonfire, yay, right? Yeah, it's fun, volleyball, all that stuff. But it's like, I just remember so vividly many, many times, one after another, I just hated the feeling of like the sand in my nails, in my toes, like everywhere in my hair. My hair is like this big because the sea salt, you know, anyone with any of the girls with me, like the sea salt would like crystallize and I'd be like, what in the world? Like I just feel so grimy and I smell like fish and I'm just sitting in my car going I can't wait to go home and shower oh my goodness oh my goodness right or you know like or after a long day of sports PE you're out on the field and you come home and you're just like drenched in that outdoor smell anyone know what smell I'm talking about it's like it's just the outdoor smell mixed with some BO right and you're just sitting there like sticky you're like oh I can't wait to go home and take a shower and I just remember feeling all these things over various moments of my life but then it's like when I took that warm shower I came out I would throw the towel on my face and go oh I love my life I feel so brand new like I feel just feel so new like anyone with me and well, after a good shower, you're just like, oh, that sense of relief. It's like, it's like that. When you get saved, you have this brand new life. But some of us, when we're going back to our old self, that's the equivalent of me digging through my laundry hamper and putting on the very clothes I took off because they were sweaty, crusty, and grimy. A lot of us do that, though, because we fail to realize that we need to keep growing in Jesus through the word of God. It's like us putting back on the grave clothes. Can you guys imagine Lazarus, four days dead, he goes back into the, into the grave clothes he just took off. And they're probably really, really gross. Like I, God forbid anyone experience that. The stench of death. Why? Why do we as believers try to put the grave clothes back on when Jesus tells us to put on our new self? I just think it comes down to we just don't know enough. We don't know enough what good things are in front of us from Jesus, from the Holy Spirit. So my question today is, what are we doing to steward the good seed of God's word in our heart? Are we wasting that chance of new life, that good seed of truth that has been deposited in us? to the things of lesser value? Or are we stoking it? Are we growing it? Are we watering it to give it a shot for us to live a life full of God's purpose and calling for our life?